Thank you, Roland. That was a lovely introduction. Welcome back, everybody. It's a pleasure. It's kind of loud, isn't it? It's a pleasure to be back here. It's my third year. And since I was here on this stage last, I've been doing a lot of traveling. Uh, I've been speaking in Colombia. I was in Bogota, in Estonia, around the States, in Canada, uh, London, and South Africa, and a few others as well. And it's a, it's a real pleasure. What happens is I fly a lot of economy class long haul travel. And so while I'm in this hazy space between sleep and awake, I come up with these crazy travel ideas. And then after a while, I take the best ones, I massage them a bit, and I send them on to Roland. And then what Roland does is he sends me this lovely email back and says, actually, that wasn't so stupid after all. Maybe you should come back to Berlin and give another keynote. So here I am this year. And the topics we talked about is overcrowding. And I want to do this little kind of mini videos. I've got a few of these, right? So this was my thought process. I said, well, imagine if we could just make tourism better better, really make it better for the traveler, make it better for the attraction, make the attraction more money in the process, make the destination more money, and make it more sustainable growth for the entire destination. Now, those are some broad strokes. So specifically, what if we could get rid of all queues, all lines at all attractions? Wouldn't that be great? You don't have to stand out there in the awful weather, sweltering in the sun, getting wet. And that thing, when you're standing in a queue, it takes you out of the consumer loop, right? So you're not shopping, you're not eating, you're not spending. There's some other really interesting things. It also puts you in a bad mood, so you're not a happy tourist. The other thing that it does, it's really interesting, is if, imagine this. So if you, could, if you could do it this way, so we could get the visitor cap, the total amount of people through the attractions more quickly, and when people traveled halfway around the world to visit an attraction like Machu Picchu, and then they can't get in, it's a crime. It feels awful for these people. Or they get to the Louvre, they see the line is so big they don't want to bother. Or imagine if we could even out those peaks and valleys of tourism so it was better for cash flow, better for short-term employment situations. We essentially really just made tourism better for everyone. I wondered if this was possible. I thought about it for a long time, put my thoughts down, and I thought this. We actually can do this. It's possible with current technology. So previously when I was here, I know I've shown a bunch of funny marketing mistakes, stuff like this, the kinder, gentler mugging. We've shown this slide. Maybe you remember this. This is currently in Australia, the town of my ass. <laughs> and we showed this sign. This year, we also asked this one other question at the previous ITB. I said, why do we travel? Remember this? And I asked travelers, you know, the travelers aren't always so rational. Do we travel to try new things, to get off the beaten path, to meet the locals, to embrace local customs? to stay in exotic new places. You can see that's San Francisco, Athens, Tokyo, New Zealand. This year, I want to ask the travel professionals, in fact, I have asked the travel professionals, why do we travel? So you know what they said? This is what I heard. To experiencing something different that you can't have at home. So what have travel professionals done, right? They took their destination, they opened up their little happy meal of destinations that they seemingly got, and they pulled out a giant London Eye type thing, they put in a hop-on, hop-off bus tour, they put in a water slide park at Hard Rock Cafe, a historical city center museum, an aquarium, a Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, a Segway tour, an H&M, a Starbucks, a Hilton, Dunkin' Donuts, Friday's Marriott, Subway, 7-Eleven, KFC, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, Benetton, Gap, Carrefour, Ikea, Disney Store, and haagen -Dazs. Welcome to our unique destination. That's what the world is doing right now. Why do we want to go anywhere? But then there's some people who are saying, no, no, it's not about the stuff, it's about the people. Travel's about the people, meeting our locals, right? So what do they do? They put up really helpful signs, great apps, hotel information. Helpful stuff, but it keeps people from meeting your locals. Bummer. What could you do? There's a lot of people who come there who want to meet your locals. I think your locals are like the hidden gold mine, that oil reserve under every city, under every culture. That's what makes your place unique. So what could you do to meet these people? Well, if you check in a hotel, they could say, what do you like to do? 
You like bird watching? We have some numbers of local bird watching members and clubs here. We could introduce you. You like to play rugby? There's a rugby club that meets every Tuesday. You like to jog? There's a jogging club that comes right by here. You could join them. We can help arrange that. I did a project for Visit Sweden that was very much like this. Um, it's called Visit a Swede. And we connected with, among other things, the big local sports network. It ran out of money for this project before we actually got the thing launched. Part of it was because the sports organizations didn't have their maps and information ready. But you just went in there and you picked something, like I think I picked fencing in this example, and it popped up the ones closest to you, the closest fencing clubs. You could click on it, get a contact email and a phone number, and ask them, hey, can I come join your fencing club for an evening? It was that easy. No one's doing it. How about this? Last time I talked about some of the most generic tourism slogans, stuff like this, blank awaits you. These are actual slogans. You want to guess? Happens to be Bolivia. How about this? Blank has it all. This one happens to be Dominican Republic. But the point is, it doesn't have to be that they're bad. I just took some from Sweden. I thought these were kind of fun. In shopping, Sweden's closest city. Then Anabi went with unique close. We have this one, wind in its sails. And then over here, they went with with wind in its sails. This is not, I'm only giving this example because it happens everywhere. Bersos went, that's Dalinas, Switzerland. And there's Norland's Hawaii. These are actual slogans. Then we have a place to live. And this one's just, this is the slogan for tourism, a municipality. And then down here, this is my favorite. Can you see this? When in, Skurup, when in Europe, don't miss Skurup. The thing is, if you look at any, here are 16 current slogans around Europe. If you just look at any of them, do any of them make you want to go there? Do you look at them and go, you know, really, I like come and find your story. Where is that? I want to go there. I love their slogan. We don't, it doesn't matter that much. More and more places are doing this, and I happen to like this better. I think this is sort of the future. As I look around ITB, destinations are getting better at marketing. So they're doing stuff like this, and this creates the great, it eliminates the double slogan, where you'll see a little slogan underneath it, and then they have a campaign where they have a different slogan. So it'll be like, unscripted, and then discover yourself. And you're like, which is it? There's two slogans on the same page. But the thing is, you don't ever want to go somewhere, even if you love the logo or like the slogan. We don't travel that way. But we do care about what's behind it, right? We'll buy something because we like the brand, but it's what they built it up to be, not because we happen to like what the logo looks like. So how are you delivering on, your, on what you promote? For example, here, it's a beautiful campaign for Incredible India. It didn't look like that when I was there. Are they delivering on what they promise? How about here? And this is a Brazilian brochure. And I'm thinking, how do they even get beaches like that? I apologize for the low resolution. You can see there in the upper right here, they've corralled the tourists to get that picture. Can they deliver on the promise that they're promoting? No. Imagine if other companies did this. Imagine if Apple did this. They promoted this in a great commercial. You went to the Apple store to buy one, and it looked like that. <laughs> and I said, we're just a marketing answer. We don't have to actually provide the product. It'd be crazy. They'd never do it. But yet we do the same thing in tourism. We we show that, and we give them that, sometimes. There's not the quality control in there. And I remember last time I said, it's got to be, the DMO can't be about marketing. The M has to stand for management to move forward. And guess what? Guam did just that. Guam did exactly that. They have a department called the Destination Management Department. And in that department, they have destination enhancement projects. They cleaned the beach. The tourist office cleaned the beach. They're fixing the roads in tourist popular areas. They're doing these things. I think this is the future of tourism. What are most DMOs doing? They're, they're being told to be content curators. This is a big part of the job anyway. You're supposed to tweet this many times and put up this many blog posts and this many pictures on Instagram and Facebook and videos on YouTube. And what I see is happening, I follow all these guys on Twitter, it's like, it's social media inflation. It's noise. Come visit us, come visit us. We're cool this year. We're cool in the winter. It's noise and people aren't paying attention. It's too much. Look at this. These are incredible statistics. This is the growth. Year over year growth from Facebook is 109%. Take all seven of those, and the average growth rate year over year is 900%. Well, duh, you're going to have some amazing social media numbers. Don't get too seduced by them. I think that's what's happening. Because you know who's the big travel writer these days? It's not me anymore. It's everybody. 
every person who sets foot in your city or your region, your, their travel writer. And this came from Facebook. It's the number one most shared thing on Facebook timelines is travel, right? And that 84% of consumers, somebody's put that up there, 84% say that their friends and family's trips inspire them. So what does that tell you? It tells you you've got to let these people do the heavy lifting for you. You know, create some great brand content. Something simple like this in Cape Town. Tee it up for these guys so they can take the picture and help sell your destination for you. Or this at the ABBA Museum in Stockholm. You just poke your head through one of these little holes and take the picture. It's physical, but it's great marketing. Or how about this? In Greece, I believe that's Santorini, right? What did they do there? Well, they kept the place looking white and blue, and they took away all the TV antennas so that people would do stuff like this and put it on their Facebook page. And it works. Because what we don't know, what we don't know is how many likes, shares, and fans equals a visitor. We don't know. This is the magic number that we're all looking for, right? We don't know. But I thought we'd look like this. What if we asked Australia? They're the world kings of social media. They're number one. They get 30 times more likes on each of their photos they put up than the average DMO. So, look at this, 5.4 million fans on their Facebook page. And this is where it went. I took this from their slide share thing. It turned right here, 2011, went bananas. But now the, you know, the verdict should be out now. We've got the data. How does this translate to visitors? Let's have a look. Well, there was their visitors, their international arrivals there in 2010. 2011 went up by 3.5. This was the big year when their social media took off between 2011 and 2012. It went up by 1.3%. How about that? The next year by 4.9. Globally, it doesn't quite stack up. I'm not saying that social media is bad, and maybe it helped them a lot. I'm just saying it's not the magic bullet. It didn't get them into the top 15. What, I talked to the head of social media from Australia, and he said basically what it is, is people like pictures of our cute Australian animals. And that doesn't necessarily translate into them buying a plane ticket to Australia for $2,000. Or how about Visit Philadelphia? They had this great campaign. They won a lot of awards, beautiful stuff. Here's their social media graphs that they can show off, really nice stuff. And it's, Philadelphia is a great place, by the way, and so is Australia. I'm not knocking the destination. Um, and the thing is, and these were provided by visitphilly.com, kindly. If you look at the, how it translates to the numbers, they said, look at year-over-year year growth was 3.2% average, and it's, that's how they're forecasting it. It wasn't phenomenal growth because they had phenomenal social media. They couldn't connect those two. Or visit Michigan. They've got the number one visited, most visited website in the U.S. of any state for seven years in a row. So how does that translate? They also, not just that, by the way, they had the, one of the best tourism campaigns of all time anywhere. They won tons of awards. They have the sixth biggest budget, and they have the most fans on Facebook. So what happened to them? Oh, sorry, they were also number one in social media on almost every category all the time. It didn't even get them into the top 22. Maybe they, maybe they rose from 50 up, but it, didn't, it doesn't mean it translates exactly. They're number 28th in the place that most people want to visit of all 50 states after seven years at the top of social media. So social media's got its place, and it probably helps, but it's not the magic bullet I've heard so many people talking about. How about if we look at it this way? What are the fastest growth destinations? And what are they doing? Well, they're curating great product, like Dubai. These guys are the world leaders. They're currently number seventh most popular. They're predicted to be number one to number three within the next seven years, most visitors, international. That's a 12.7% year-over-year growth rate for 20 years. It's phenomenal. And what are they doing? By the way, their passengers, it's even higher amongst the passengers, and they're a great hub that way, and that's part of their success. So they're creating the world's tallest building. They're putting a fountain show on it. They're having this great aquarium at their mall. They have indoor skiing. They have a cool metro station. They have award-winning hotels. They have Sega World. They have dune bashing, great water slide parks, and this new, soon-to-be-built, enormous indoor theme park. They're creating content. How many Twitter followers do they have? 10,000. I don't know that you can show a really strong connection, at least in these cases. Birmingham, England, fastest growing city last year. What are they doing? Put up lots of new buildings, go online. There's some fantastic architecture there. New stuff's going up all the time. They just created this 129 million pound public library that got a lot of attention, and they're in the middle of a 600 million pound new central station that looks phenomenal. 
New York Times and New York Magazine have called them it's the new cultural capital. They say, go to Birmingham instead of London. They're creating product. Now, these guys are spending a fortune. Am I telling you you should do that? I don't think you have to. That's product. That's product. The tomato fight, not terribly expensive. When I was in Estonia speaking, they were, they were telling me about how wonderful it was with their boulders. They have the biggest collection of boulders in Europe. And I said, with all due respect, who cares? I don't want to go. How can you activate this? And this was just a suggestion. I said, here's one idea. You could have Europe's biggest natural parkour event there and activate them without a lot of infrastructure. Just an idea. And any way you cut it, you've got to figure out how you're going to connect people with the destination, right? You've got to make it personal, unique, interactive, and engaging. So good, better, best. Why do you have to do this? Well, there was a great study that just came out late last fall. Where the, the UK did, they, inter, they interviewed or surveyed 10,000 international travelers, and they found out that this is what they wanted to do when they came to the UK. Number one, Buckingham Palace, Shard in the London Eye tied for second place, and then you had uh, Edinburgh Castle. When they got there, if you compare this to what happened on TripAdvisor, as I just did, I found that this is how it ranked. Buckingham Palace was 83rd of rated things to do just in London. The Shard came in there, the London Eye came in at 90th, and here with Edinburgh Castle, that's 18th, not of things to do in the UK, just in Edinburgh. Why the low rating? Well, I was thinking about it. Well, there's a couple reasons. This is what came to mind. I think people had high expectations. These are the things they most wanted to do. There were probably crowds there. It was expensive. They're resting on their reputation, maybe not great service. Maybe they didn't add value. Like when you went up the Eiffel Tower, there wasn't like a string quartet playing and a vineyard sponsoring a free wine tasting. It wasn't that extra thing. And perhaps some of the smaller places were better at getting people to give ratings on TripAdvisor. What did Disney do? I didn't know. My kids were asking me, went there recently, and I said, I don't know what you do at the castle. It ex exceeded their expectations because they said they thought they weren't going to be able to go into it. Instead, there was a huge Disney show there. They never expected to see lights and fireworks there. It exceeded it. They added value, and they're doing quality control on top of this. Last year, I put up this slide, and I said, I asked a lot of the professionals, including Professor Conradi, if tourism can run, and they all basically said, yes, it can. It's not as lovely as this. It can also be too much of a good thing. So we've got these crowds all over the place, and they're getting bigger. And part of the problem is that that's a destination with a crowd problem. And they might not think of it as a crowd problem, because most of the year it looks like this. But just a few days of the year, perhaps, it looks like that. It's the same beach. So some people are in some kind of like they're proud of their crowds, and other people are in denial about their crowds. That's part of the problem. And then when you're in denial about your crowds, you've got a problem, because it goes up on TripAdvisor, and people talk about it. These are overcrowded, and they're reacting, and they're not going. This is put up by the UNWTO. Here's this big number. What this part is up here, there are your crowds right there. How do we get rid of it? Well, we could just put a hard ceiling on it and kind of hope it widens it out. I suggested this last year, in part at the very end. Like San Fernando de Neruña, the island off the coast of Brazil, says 400 people, no more. And they hope it spreads out. And what they've done is they've kind of they've engineered a line. And I still think this is possible with many destinations. You can engineer a line in the same way these nightclubs do. There's probably 10 people inside the nightclub early in the evening, and they make you wait to get in. And that creates some of the demand. But that only works for certain places. The trick is, how do you do that with a free market? That's the trick. How do you do that? What is that movable peak? When we take that peak and we put it down to the valley, who is that? Who are those people? And I think they look like this. They look like this. These are the people that you're trying to move, right? So how do you move an active, older, rich couple? Let's look at Bhutan. They did it. They managed, look at there, this is their peak season. It's off season because these are the best times of the year to visit. These tourists are independently wealthy. It costs a fortune to get there, and they're going when it's nice. And in fact, Bhutan has tried to shift people to come off their off season by offering lower prices. And it didn't work because these people have a lot of money and they don't care and they want it to be there when it's best. 
So I think the model you have to use is I call this like the popular restaurant model. So it's just got a great review. You call up to book, and they're full. And they can say, well, you can go in a couple months. We can get you in. Or they say, well, we can get you in on a f Wednesday night instead of a Saturday or a Friday. Or they say, you can go now, but you have to sit at the bar. We can't actually get you a table. Think of that how it applies to the going to Uganda. If you want to go to Uganda and see the gorillas, and I say, you can go to Uganda, you just can't get in to see the gorillas because there's a big queue to see the gorillas. Do you still want to go to Uganda? So that's your option. You can go there now, and you can uh, not see them, or you can go off-season and see them, or book earlier for next year. Those are your basic three options. The trick is, how do you do that? That's a one-trick one pony right there. How do you do that in a city with multiple must-see destinations? You've got to kind of fit them together somehow. That's the trick. Part of it comes to carrying capacity, right? And this is how we've looked at it for so many years. It's hotel nights plus average number of visitors, which is around 1.2, and there's your carrying capacity. It's more complicated than that. Here's how you've got to think. You've got to think like a theme park. Right? In a theme park, here's how we currently do it, right? There's your tourist usage. These are the, how much tourists use, that red circle, how much we use as tourists of all these different things. More hotels, less transport. The rest is by locals, right? With a theme park, they do it like this. They use everything. All the visitors in the theme park use like that, right? So if they want to grow it and more visitors, what does a theme park do? They add another ride. And then if they add another ride, they need another restaurant. If they need another restaurant, they need other bathrooms and so forth. And they grow organically, right? They don't just make the lines longer. So we need to do the same thing in a theme park, OK? We need to think of theme park usage like this. It all has to expand. Same for travel. You can't just add more hotels, because then it makes the destinations more crowded. I'm going to have to speed things along a little bit so we get caught up and make sure we're out of here in time. Anyway, it has to grow organically. Just a quick example with the Vasa Museum. Europe, no, Scandinavia's most popular attraction, right? They get 80% in peak season during four hours a day. Now, they could look at that, and they could say, we only get crowds 14% of our yearly opening hours. Or they could say, instead, 70% of our annual visitors experience overcrowding. There's two ways to look at the same number. Here's part of the problem as well. They get 2,000 people. It holds 2,000, but only 1,000 comfortably. They get three ticket windows. 400 visitors get in per hour, stay for an average of 90 minutes, so there's only 600 people in at once. So they get too many people outside and not enough people inside. Right? So let's just say how this problem is. We're going to have to move things wrong real quickly. Um, I'm going to try to narrate this. So here's how this problem goes. And again, sort of like the iPhone, Steve Jobs didn't invent any aspect of the GPS or the phone. He just put them together. And I'm not comparing myself to Jobs. I'm just saying this is a combination of existing technologies. So as it currently works, when you show up in an attraction, if there's not many people, you go right in. If there's more people, you got a queue, right? So what you can do is open an extra till, and hopefully that'll help. Or you can add some machines like they've done at the Louvre and other places, and that'll help. But when you get a lot of crowds, if you could just add Wi-Fi, everyone's carrying their own ticketing device on their phone. Let them go in, pay with PayPal, pay with Google Wallet, or their own credit card. It's pretty simple, basic stuff. Next part of it is like this. The next part of the thing is to have booking with timed entry. Again, this is done before. It's the same way it works with airlines and with hotels and rent-a-car agencies. You just get people to sign up, and this is going to eliminate a lot of problems. Oh my gosh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to out of here in time. We have to move this thing along. Anyway, so here, when you go to an exhibit, it looks like this. People come more in the middle of the day and not so much in the morning and not so much in the afternoon. But if you have these start times like they do in golf, it evens it out and you can get more annual people or more daily visitors in. And it feels less crowded while they're there. The other thing it does, in addition to doing that, I'm going to move ahead of this a little bit, is that it makes it better for your workflow. Oh, God, I better catch up with the video. You can print out your tickets at home. You can get a mobile ticketing device. Um, and you can go in either with these fancy machines like they have on the subway, or you can have a handheld device that lets people come in. But it's important that you keep track of that valuable entry data. The entry data really helps things out, because you need to figure out how long people want to spend in your attractions. So you can help you with staffing problems. I was ugh, jumping ahead of my own video. Um, so, right, it helps you with the staffing issues. 
It helps you, because it's part of the problem with tourist destinations in peak season is you have these college kids that are coming in that don't quite know the job. It stresses them out when there's a peak performance going on, or peak amount of people coming in. And uh, the other thing is you think, if this is such a brilliant idea, why aren't more people doing it? And they are. They're starting to do this more and more. The Harry Potter, the Uffizi Museum, the, uh, the Vatican, the uh, Alhambra, they're all using this basic same technology, right? It's a piece of cake. And then there's another part of this equation, which is optimizing your foot flow. And what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to stop it right there, so make sure we finish in time to get out of here. You can put up a special device that can track people by their mobile phone usage. You can track where there's bottlenecks at these attractions, and you can use devices to spread people out throughout the attraction. That gets them through quicker, you bring in more people, and your whole attraction is optimized, so you're getting in like, the maximum amount of money per place. It's pretty simple. So now, with these guys take in 2,500 people a day. If they had start times, they could bring in 6,000. With optimized foot flow, they could bring in about 9,000. And the other thing you can do is you can open up spending. If it's on your app, like they do at the, at the Apple Store, you can connect it so they can just grab a quick snack, a Coke, a coffee, pay for it on their phone, show the card on the way out. If they've got a band or a card, tap it, open up payments that way. If people have paid in advance, it's last month's budget, and they're more likely to spend more at the gift shop than they're there now. So you've got the tourist usage expanding. And we're just trying to figure out, when you get everybody, not just one attraction, you get all the attractions on board, then it becomes a bit magical, right? Because you know, and once you know how many people are there, it's kind of like it's a gorilla. You've kind of created one out of it. You see how many total amounts of bookings that your must-sees that your city can hold. And once you do that, it's kind of like having the Fed or the National Bank or the OPEC. You can control it. If it's a school holiday that week, you can say, we're having only families coming this week or a certain amount citywide, and you can affect the bookings that way. Let's we'll see if we can get this one last little quick one in. Just about on the home stretch here. So here's how it works. You've got a great API for this data. It goes out. So people sitting anywhere in the world when they're on their favorite booking engine, what they can do is go on, sign in, and they can see it that way. We already do it this way, as you recall, with Broadway shows and West End shows. Once you say you're going to London, it pops up and says, do you want to go to any of these shows? This way right here. So we can do it this way. In that way, you're letting the bookings for these things affect the total demand for the destination. It's, that's the bottleneck, right? So what it does is it unlocks a number of other fantastic things. It gives you a decision. You can say, OK, I guess my favorite attractions are all booked up now. I'll go at another time, another city. I'll come back off season. Or I'll just take my chances on standby. But at least it's not the airlines and the hotels. Hotels just build more hotels, and the airlines bring in more flights, who are determining the quality of and the number of people at the destination. And that's a decision that's going to help lead to sustainable growth for the destination, because it grows organically that way. i got about one more minute. hope that's OK. We all right? One more minute. Um, and once you do this, if they're starting to book multiple things, what they can do is Google, they can attach it to Google Maps, and it can say you haven't allowed enough time between the destinations. You can create a wish list. They can SMS you when your favorite places become available. There's all sorts of cool things. It's really unlimited. You can let the more popular attractions lift up the unpopular ones. If you say, I want to book here, you get a time in two hours, but it says there's another attraction right nearby that you can get into right away while you're waiting. So it helps spread out the tourists in a better way. Um, and you connect it to city cards as well. And this also applies to free museums. And not just free museums, it can also apply to popular city hiking trails that go overcrowded. There's no reason it should be like a human traffic jam just because you're in nature. And the way you could do something like that is you could take like an iPad-type device, put it in a little waterproof shelter, and when people book their hike, they get a little code. They punch in their code for their hike, and it's an honor system, but off they go. It keeps people spread out. It's sort of like an honor sister golfing tea time. And that's it. It's using existing technologies that we have already in other markets, putting them together in a smart way to help change the way that overcrowding can affect the destination. That's it. Thank you so much for coming.